Hey, man. So uh, I, I want to talk briefly on the topic, living in this moment. Okay? It's called living in this moment. Um, how this message took birth was we were talking about living in a moment and then living in this moment and God stirred something up inside me. I said, you know what, I think I need to clarify that a little bit more, uh, talking about living in this moment, because sometimes we have a moment. What I want to uh, explain is we just had a moment, okay? When we are praying or when we're uh, worshiping God, you know, that's a moment. You know, you may get into the Word of God and, and you know, it, it speaks to you, that's a moment. You may pray, and as you're praying, you have an experience with God. That's a moment. A moment is having an experience with God. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, verse 2 through 3, uh, something that's very special that God shows us that there is a, such a thing of having a moment on earth, but there's also a, such a thing of us living in this moment. Like, and I want to talk about that. I'm going to unpack that. But let's look at Mark chapter 9. Verse two through three. OK, uh, Jesus took Peter, James and John to the top of the mountain. And uh, no one else was there. And, you know, suddenly his face began to shine with glory, the Bible says. And his clothing was dazzling white. It, they became dazzling white. And, it, and now, you know, it was a glory that was far more than earth possibly could ever imagine or could make up, you know. And so so suddenly his face began to shine with glory and his clothes became dazzling white, far more glorious than any earthly process could ever make it. And so here on earth, you can't get this glory. He says there, something happened with Jesus on earth, but he had an experience that you actually can't get here on earth. And I, and I know that we chase after certain things that actually Cause us to feel like, oh, this is the moment, you know, having a lot of money. Oh, this is the moment. Having my, my first child, oh, that's the moment. Or purchasing my house or being in love with someone. Have you ever heard someone say, I cannot live without them? I'm like, so what do you do? Like, if they leave, that you die? Or how, how does that work? You know, I want to know how that one works because I can't live without them. That, that type of love, right? And, but that type of love is not even what the Bible is explaining right here. Even the type of uh, finances that, would, you know, that we've never seen with commas and you know, period marks in places that we would think like, wow, I would never think that I could have that much money. That won't do this. It says, let's look at this. It says, suddenly his face began to shine with glory. OK, verse three says, and his clothing became dazzling white, far more glorious than any earthly process could ever make it like. So he was having a moment like something was happening with Jesus here on earth. And, and Peter and James and John actually witnessed it. And so, you know, what's crazy is he went on a mountaintop. So, of course, we know that mountaintops is always an explanation or it's explaining to us a God moment, a God season, an experience with God. He was on a mountaintop. They went to the top of the mountain with him, and Jesus had an experience with God right there, and he's showing us the power of a moment. Because there's a power in moments. You, you, can have, you, you can have a moment and there's power. And have, you, have you ever had an experience with God? There, there's nothing like the presence of the Father. There, there's nothing like having time with God. And, and if you haven't had time with God like that, I really challenge you to, to dig deep into seeking out an experience with God, the Father. It's something about the Father. You, you feel like everything's okay. That you could be in turbulent times, trying times, you know, tempting time, but when you are in the presence of God, it, everything's all right. It's not going to overwhelm you. You know everything's going to be fine. And that's what was happening with Jesus. Jesus is on, on top of a mountain. He's having a moment with God. There's a power in a moment. There's power in having a moment. These experiences have the ability to change and redefine our entire lives. Moments with God. 
They're having a moment with God. And and I can understand how some of us may not even be attracted to that. But I'm going to tell you a moment with God would change everything. A moment with God would actually catapult you into a, a, a area, an arena in your life that you have never been in before, ever. It reminds me of a little girl. She was running from a dopamine peacher, a dog. And, and so this dog was pursuing her, and she was crying. She was petrified, terrified, scared. And so as she's running, she's trying to get away, and then she sees her dad. So she beelines to her dad, and she jumps in his arms. And all of a sudden, the fear, that she had swelling up in her hearts, and her heart kind of went away. She still had she still had tears, she still was getting herself together, and as her father embraced her, the fear that she had went away from her heart. Now, what did not change was the dog. The circumstances didn't change. The dog was still there, still barking, showing his teeth, The dog was still trying to pursue her, but that was the power of having a moment with the father. And that's how it is with God. Your situation may not change. Some people come to God as as if they're trying to use him to change everything. And God may not change it. It Just may not happen. Some people swerving down like you must don't have faith because it didn't change. It may not supposed to change. What if I was supposed to change in this moment with God? Some of us, we come to God with a usatory mindset. We come to God thinking that you're supposed to change this, God. If you don't change it, you're not real. That, that's not true. God has come to change us. And so, so many times we come with this mentality because we don't understand the power of a moment with God. The power of being with God. Jesus had a direct connection. He had contact with God. And we know that on the mountaintop, God reveals himself to us and he also reveals us to us he reveals to us our identity so there's power in the moment there's also an excitement the excitement of a moment you know people get super excited you ever be in a moment and you're so excited you ever been in God's presence and and the experience is so exciting it's so exciting that you actually don't even know what to say anybody ever been in those you don't even know what to say You don't know what to do. Some people cry. Some people get on their knees. Others, you know, begin to start speaking in different languages. Uh, Other people begin to just sit there and just get calm and still. But those mountaintop experiences are very important. Very important because there's an excitement. There's power in a moment, but there's also excitement in the moment. In Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 5 through 6, we see the same thing happen to Peter. Peter, he said, teacher, this is wonderful. He's like so excited that we're having a moment. Oh, my God. God's glory is here. God's presence is here. He said, teacher, this is wonderful, Peter exclaimed. Like he's all excited. You know, Peter always had something to say. We will make three shelters here and, and one for each of you. Because at this time, there, it was Moses and Elijah and Jesus there. And so he feels as if like, hey, you know, this moment means that you need to actually stay right here. He didn't know what to say. He just started running in his mouth, you know, as if Moses and Elijah wanted to come back here on earth. They had already died, and they were like in the ultimate moment, right? You know, in paradise at that time. And so why would they want to be back here on earth? But he don't know what to say. He's just so excited, you know. And so he said, he said this because he didn't know what to say. He was just talking. He said this just to be talking, verse 6 says, for he didn't know what else to say, and they were all terribly frightened. He didn't know what to say. Have you ever been in an exciting moment with God and you really don't know what to say? You don't know what to do. You don't know how to express yourself. You don't know, you know, what to say. You start rambling sometimes. Just, you know, have you ever been in prayer and you just start rambling all kinds of stuff? You're like, oh, God, I didn't mean to say that. But uh, yeah, because you're excited and you're you're very excited in this moment. You know, I heard a guy that when uh, there was a lot of hype about a certain celebrity, um, you know, he he. he 
he seen him. He was like, oh, my God, he went to the West Coast. He went to Hollywood and he actually seen the celebrity. He's like, oh, my God. And so he ran up to him. He's so excited. He says, hey, uh, I always want to know you. And he was like, OK. He's like, hi. He's like, all right. He's like, man, you, you, you're taller than I thought. And the guy's like, OK, you want to picture anything? No, you're just tall. And then he just walked off and he was like, man. And then when he walked away, he's like, I blew that moment. Like, I didn't get a picture. I didn't say I didn't hug him. I didn't, hey, he just blew the moment because he just didn't know what to do in the midst of the, the situation. That's what happens a lot of times when we're with God. We are so excited about being with him. We don't even know what to do. Peter was right here. He didn't even know what to say. He didn't even know. He says, the Bible says in verse 6, Mark chapter 9, verse 6, he said, he said this just to be talking, meaning I, I, I suppose say something, right? So I'm just going to say something. And so this is the issue, though. Though there's power in a moment, though that we get excited in moments, let me give you this. We need to learn how to bring our moments into reality. We need to learn how to bring those mountaintop experiences down into the valley. We need to learn how to bring those experiences down into our marriages. We need to learn how to bring those experiences in worship and in prayer and in the word of God into our marriages. We need to bring them into our, our relationships, into our families or, or at our jobs or, or into our communication and how we think and how we act. A lot of times what we miss it at is we don't bring those moments into reality. We have an experience with God. We, we worship, we're crying, we're in tears, and later on we're over mad and upset and frustrated and ready to curse someone out. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I got nobody online that had those type of problems or anyone in here. But the fact of the matter, there's someone you know, maybe you, that have experiences, but then yet they don't know how to transfer that into their reality. They don't know how to, tra they don't know how to bring their moment down into their reality. Oh, how many people uh, counsel and premarital counseling and, and, and hanging out with people and connecting with them. And for some weird reason, they have great times in the church. That's why a lot of people are struggling right now that we're not having worship in a building. People struggle with not worshiping a building because they don't know how to take this moment in the building and take it to their neighborhood and take it into their house. They don't know how to take it into their job. They don't know how to take it with them. They don't know how to learn how to live in this moment. They had a moment, but don't know how to live in this moment, day in, day out. It's very important to understand that God wants to help us bring those mountaintop experiences down into the valleys in the everyday situations of life. Mark chapter 9, verse 9 says, as they went back down the mountain. I just want to look at that. That's it. That's, that's it. That's all I want to see is that. As they went down the mountain, meaning you're up there and you're having an experience, but you're going to have to come down eventually. You're not going to worship all day. That's not reality. You got to go pay your bills. You got to go home. You got to go with your wife. You have to go with your children. You have to go to your husband. You have to contact other people. So after you have your mountain time experience, he says, as they came down, as they went back down the mountain, meaning they had to come back down there because God is going to speak to you on the mountain. God is going to have you have a powerful moment. You're going to be excited at Excited in that mountaintop, you're going to have an experience with God that caused you to be excited. But then you got to bring that moment down to reality. You got to come back down to earth. You're going to have to talk to someone normal without Christianese language. You, you know when someone is growing spiritually because they have believers as their friends, obviously. They have fellowship with other believers, obviously. But also they have relationships with people that aren't saved. Yeah. I'm not saying you hang out with them and do what they do, but how are you ever going to reach somebody if you don't know how to communicate with them? How are you ever going to get somebody saved if you're always talking about amen, praise God? 
And then you surround yourself around nothing but people that say that's scary. That's scary because, you know, what I'm saying what you're doing is making the Christian faith look like a cult or something. Like if you're not saved, you can't be around me. You got to bring your your moment down to reality. You got to bring that moment down so other people can see it, not hear it, see it. Because Some people talk real good, but they don't know how to walk real good. And so the fact of the matter is, is we got to bring our moment into reality. So we got to come down from the mountain. We got to go. We can't stay there. You got to come home eventually. You can't live at the church. You can't live in prayer all day. You can't live with your nose and your Bible all day. You can't live with your hands and crying. I mean, your hands lifted up and you're crying all day worshiping. You just can't do that much as that experience is powerful because there's power in a moment. There's excitement even in a moment, but you got to bring your moment into reality. But let's, what hinders us from living in this moment? What hinders us from walking in the presence of God day in and day out? What hinders us from being able to take that, that moment and bring it down to reality? What hinders us? What stops us from being able to walk that walk and not just talk that talk? What Hinders us from being able to walk in this moment and reveal to other people who aren't saved. Or, remember I was talking about there's groups of people that you you should have, you know, as friends. People who are saved, people who aren't saved, and people who are fallen. All of it's biblical. The Bible wants us to be able to reach people that may have been walking with the Lord but fail. And so those relationships are very important. And your moment really defines whether you can actually acclimate yourself to relationships in that manner. Be able to deal with people that aren't saved. You know, some of us, we got a low tolerance. Meaning if somebody start acting worldly, you got to like pull out, you act like you got to pull out a scripture. Well, the Bible says, like, come on, man. (laughs) It's like, I really got transformed more through people showing me love than people telling me truth. Because some people always want to speak truth, and that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I, I knew that was wrong before I said it. Boy, I did it. You know you wrong. Everything we do wrong, you know you did wrong. Come on now. No, no, you know what you did. And you know it was wrong. But do I really need you to beat me over my head with telling me I'm wrong? Or do I need you to just love on me? And so the fact of the matter is we got to watch ourselves because we need to make sure that we don't hinder ourselves from living in this moment. What hinders us from living in this moment? I'm going to tell you one thing that hinders us from living in this moment is lack of development. After we get saved, many of us, we don't want to learn how to practice the presence of God. Practice learning how to live in his presence. And it's awkward because we don't we're not used to being there. We're used to being in our own skin. We're not used to being in his world and in his presence. That's not normal for us. What's normal is for me to use my own brain, not your thinking. God, what's, what's, what's normal for me is to do things the way I want to do it, not the way you want to do it, God. You know, what's normal for me is to say things when I want to say it, not when you tell me I should say it, God. So now i got to retrain myself. i got to develop in learning how to wait on God. i got to learn how to develop myself in walking in his presence because, oh, that is awkward. Have you ever been in worship? Powerful moment. Remember, Peter had been hanging out with Jesus for three years at this time, a little bit over three years. And Jesus, he goes up on the mountaintop and start praying. And they're in God's presence like crazy, like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Hey, maybe we should get three tents because he don't know what to say. Maybe we should get three shelters because he don't know what to say. Maybe we should build three houses, three condos for you, Jesus, and for Moses and for Elijah, because, man, I really don't know what to say. Now, he had been walking around Jesus for three years plus, and he still don't know what to say when he's in God's presence. How much more is it for you and I that after we get saved and we accept the Lord, if you have accepted the Lord, that we need to learn how to develop in walking in God's presence? This is what hinders us from being in this moment, in God's presence, handling that moment and carrying it with us and taking it into our everyday lives and taking it into our marriages, taking it into our families, taking it to the job, because some folks wouldn't know you were saved unless you told them at your job. 
because of not knowing how to carry out that moment. They may hear one thing, but they may not see you live a certain way. I heard this guy. He was uh, he started saying some things on social media, Facebook, I believe. And he started saying some real thing, crazy things. It was about when the climax of, you know, Black Lives Matters and a lot of, uh, you know, racist comments was being said. And, and this guy said some things uh, that was, I guess someone felt like it was, it wasn't proper at the, in this season. You know, it just wasn't right to say in this season. You may say that later, but not right now, you know, because the temperature's rising, you know. Temperature's rising, bro. I mean, you know, and so it was hot at the time. And so he said it, and somebody jumped on his page and said, you know what, I can't believe you would say that. That's why all the time you invited me to your church, that's probably why I never went. Because the simple fact that, you know what, you talk about it a lot, but man, for you to say something like that, man, as a Christian, I, I thought you was a man of faith. And I was like, whoa, I said, let me just scroll past this one. It's getting a little hot. But the fact of the matter is, you and I, we have to learn how to bring that moment into reality. And one of the things that hinders us is a lack of development. Uh, that's what happened with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, they were like crazy deranged. I mean, they were on one for real. They were having all kind of sex with, I mean, with, with all kind of prostitutes. And one guy said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and have sex with my wife my mother and and I mean, it was just crazy people were having lawsuits they were they were having problems and they didn't know how to take it uh they didn't know how to handle it they always had to run to somebody out they had to run outside the church for them to handle some things that it seemed like if you got the power of god you'd be able to handle amongst one another and so they went to judges that weren't saved you know and so paul writes this letter and he says man look first corinthians chapter three verse one he says when i was with you i couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk with not solid food. Because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. This is the kicker. For you are still controlled by your sinful natures, meaning you don't know how to live in this moment. You don't know how to live in God's presence because you are controlled by your sinful nature, meaning your selfishness. And then he gives them proof because when somebody's fleshly, carnal, and don't know how to walk with God, which we're all on our journey, let's get that understood. We're all on our journey. But you always got to bring our state evidence, Exhibit A. Look what he said. <laughs> Look, he says, you are jealous of one another. Exhibit B, you quarrel with each other. He has to bring evidence to them because they wouldn't accept it if they didn't have no evidence. Like, you got to catch them in it. If you don't catch them in it, they're not going to confess because, remember, they're controlled by their simple self because of a lack of development. But if a person was developed, they would allow God to convict them and say, eee, you know what, that was wrong. Because now they're learning how to bring that moment into their reality, and now God deals with them about what's right and wrong. Are you getting this or not? Let me tell you this. I want you to take this home with you. Immaturity destroys our moments. Immaturity destroys our moments. Not that you didn't have a moment. Not that you didn't experience God and you didn't cry. And, and not that that wasn't real because it was real. But you just destroy, you know, the moment, meaning you don't walk in that moment continually. So that moment was just a little taste. It's like if you've ever been to Sam's, right? If you go to Sam's on the weekend, I love going to Sam's on the weekend. Okay, Sam's is a place, it's like a spinoff of Walmart. Same person owns it, Sam Walton's family now. And so they have this big distribution center where you can get things in bulk, right? And what I like about Sam's is on the weekends. Typically, you can walk through there and taste pretty much everything they got for free. So if you're hungry one day and you don't have no food, just walk in the sand, right? But what I'm saying, you go in there, you just taste test stuff. You're like, man, you know, wow, okay, that's good. No, I'm good, I'm good. I'm, I usually don't buy nothing, but I'm going to eat everything they give me, though. Don't, don't, don't judge me, neither, because I'm sure you do something. But, but that's, what, that's what, let me tell you, you taste test. 
You know, just in case you want to buy into what they got, right? They say, well, we got crackers and cheese. I'll take that. Well, what kind of cheese is Gouda? Oh, I'll take it. Yeah, I love it. Okay, now you taste it. And once you taste it, you can determine whether you want to buy into it. Well, that's what worship and prayer and getting into God's word is. It's just a taste test. Because really, ultimately, he wants you to buy into being with him continuously. It's not like I want you to just be with me just for this moment. I want you to be with me continually because I love you so much. But a lack of development hinders that. You know, also, I'm going to tell you another thing that hinders that, a misunderstanding of what God requires out of us. A misunderstanding of what God requires out of us. When we don't know what God requires out of us, it's hard for us to live with him because, you know, we don't know that this is what, you know, kind of like hinders us from being with him. We don't even know when we don't, when we don't just get into God's word, when we don't, you know, get, be taught well. And because of a lack of development, what happens is we find ourselves doing things that God should do. And then we expect God to do things that he want us to do. No, listen to that. Because you can only do what you can do and let God do what he does. But many times we find ourselves trying to do what God's supposed to do. And then on the other hand, we want him to do what he want us to do. Like, we're over upset. I know a lot of people disappointed with God, hurt with God, and frustrated with God because they thought God was supposed to do a particular thing. And it was God was like, you're supposed to do that. Like, why are you mad at me when you're supposed to do that? Let me give you an example. Some people say, well, I'm just praying that God will remove that person out of my life. Why don't you remove them? Why are you putting that on God? That's easy. Just change your number. Put block their number. You know what I'm saying? Stop hanging out with them. Pretty simple. They knock on your door. Don't answer the door. Whatever. You know, call them and say, you know, eventually when you get tired, they say, look, man, I'm moving on because guess what? It's just not right. This does not fit. I have to for the betterment of my life and my future. I love you, though, man. That don't mean you don't love them, but you always say, I'm just praying God will remove them. You mean move, remove them? Why don't you remove them? That's not right. Because get what, what, what you're doing is you're expecting God to do what you're supposed to do. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24. It says, this means that you must stop. Who must stop? You must stop. You must stop living the evil way you lived before. He's not telling us to wait for, he's not saying, will you wait for me to remove that evil from you? He didn't say that. He said, now, this means you must stop living the evil way you lived before. That old, old self gets worse and worse because people are fooled by the evil they want to do. You must be made new in your hearts and in your thinking Watch what it says. This is something he's telling us to do. Be that new person who, has, who was made to be like God. Whose responsibility is that? He says, be that new person. Be that new person. You know, be that new man. Be that new woman. Be that new guy. I gave you the tools. Now you be it. That's why a lot of people are hindered. In living in God's presence because one lack of development and because of a lack of development they don't understand what God requires out of them and then some people don't don't live in God's presence or or want to live in God's presence or they're hindered from living in this moment downright refusal they just refuse to be in God's presence I don't want to I want to come feel good on Sunday and cry and go home and do whatever I want to do. And if you say something about me, I'm going to say you judging me instead of being honest that I'm not developed and I don't know what God wants of me because I really don't care because I'm going to do whatever I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And because of that, I got all this X, Y, and Z going on in my life, but I'm going to come and ask for counseling and throw it before you and say, hey, can you fix that? Knowing good and well, I didn't refuse to do what God wanted me to do. Even though I know this is why it's going on, this is why it's happening, this is why I'm having these problems, this is why all this hardship is going on, this is connected to this, but I just refuse. I refuse. I just downright refuse. And James 
puts it like this. He says, if you fail to do what you know is right, you are sinning. If you fail to do what is right, Bible say you are sinning, meaning you know what you should be doing. You just downright refuse to do it. Knowing what God wants, but just not doing it because these moments is not where I want to be. I, wanna, I do not want to be in God's presence that way. And because I, do, I downright refuse to actually live in these moments, these moments I have, they're short-lived. I have good spurts. I have good runs. I have a great time for a moment with God, but then I just do what I want to do. So they're short-lived moments. Not, not, I'm not living in this moment. I have a great moment with God. So refusal to do what God wants you to do causes deep scar tissues in the future. Spiritual scar tissue. Yeah, you can't take that one back. Any, any of you guys got some places or any, any of you ladies or anybody have some, some places where they, they've been cut or something happened, they were wounded, and you know, you, you know what happened there because there's some scar tissue. Those are some things you can never take back. Some people say, what is the worst, what is the best teacher? Some people say experience. I say, that's a lie. Experience sometimes gives you a lot of scar tissue in life that you just can't take back. Yes, the Lord forgives you. Yes, God, you're forgiven. Watched in the blood. You're new. And he gives you a second chance. We know that. But when you come up out of there, you, ain't, you don't come out unscathed. You got some scar tissue. Because guess what? There's some things that happen that you just can't take back. And so if I'm talking about what hinders us from living in this moment, let's go ahead and get this clear. We can live in this moment, so what? We can live in this moment. We can live in this moment, so what do I suppose to do, or how do I suppose to live in this moment? How do I live in this moment? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to know what God requires of you. Remember, if not living in God in this moment or God's presence hinders you from actually being able to live in God's presence, then knowing what God requires out of you really helps you. That's very important. It's difficult to live in this moment, his presence, if I don't know what he desires out of me. It's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's very difficult for you to be able to live. Watch this. I know a lot of people that have relationships and they end up getting married, but they don't know one another. They don't know what, what, they, what the spouse like or, or what, you know, what would keep peace in the relationship. Like for me, I became a student of my wife, Elena. And, and she does the same with me. I become a student to know what she likes and what she does not like. And what she does not like, I remove. And what she do like, I do that more. I enhance that boy. I blow that boy up. You know what I mean? Why? Because I want her to be pleased. Why would I have something that I know good and well does not please her in my, and, that, and I can easily say, well, she, she could just forgive me. Yes, she can, but scar tissue again, remember? Scar tissue is going to be a whole bunch of scar tissue in our relationship. Why? Because I just downright refuse to change, and which says a lot about how much I love her as well, you know, and because the fact of the matter is I need to know what, you know, makes her heart throb. I need to know that. Same thing with God. Having a relationship with God, you and I, we need to know what God requires out of us. How are we going to live with him? How are we going to hang out with him? How are we going to, you know, because there are certain things that God says separates us from him. Yeah, there are certain things, that, and, and all throughout the Bible it talks about that. There's things that separate us from God, and it speaks about it clearly. And so this is the importance of going through a journey of being developed and, and being trained and, and being taught, you know, being around the people of God, getting under the discipleship and learning from everyone you come in contact with. Some of us, what we do is we count out people and we think that they can't teach us. And that's why, you know what I'm saying, we don't know what God required of us because we, we're, not, we're not open to learn. We got to be able to learn from everybody. I mean, everybody we learn something from. It's like, what do I suppose 
to get out of this relationship. I have to learn something. And so Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17 says this. It says, so don't be foolish with your lives. Oh, I wish I had somebody online that could just type that in. Don't be foolish with your life. But learn what he, the Lord wants you to do. So it's important to know what the Lord wants you and I to do. It's important. It's important to know what he wants. It, how can I be in a relationship with you, but I don't know what you want? How can I, how can I please you if I don't know what pleases you? So the first thing we got to have is we got to know what God requires out of us. Second thing we got to have is personal growth. In order for us to live in these moments, we got to have per personal growth. We got to be on a journey. The result of knowing what God requires can lead to personal growth. It has the ability to lead to personal growth. Some of us, we know what God requires, but we go back to that other one. What hinders us from being in his presence is we downright refuse to do what he requires. But if you want to be in his presence, if you want to learn how to walk with him, if you want to begin to, a journey with him, you got to have personal growth. Take a journey. And I mean, it's a challenge. It is. Oh, my God, this has been a challenge growing. It's, it's challenging every day. It's been a challenge for the last 15 and a half, 16 years of my life. This is not have some people think that like you made it after a certain time, like you can kick up your feet on your desk and you, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I've made it. No, nah, it's always a challenge internally. It's always a challenge externally. It's always a challenge in Billy's life. Always, every single day, I'm navigating through challenges. Challenges as seen and challenges unseen. Why? Because the simple fact, I want to grow now. I don't have to challenge myself. I could lay it down and act as if I don't care about growing up and maturing and being a better person. You know, because it, it begins to get tiresome. You know what I mean? And that battle, you know, it's like being in the, in the ring, you know what I'm saying, with someone for 12 rounds. You, you're fighting and it just, it takes a toll on you sometimes. Sometimes you just want to, what happens, you just want to throw in the towel. Now, I'm not saying throw in the towel and quit as a Christian, but I'm going to stop growing, but I'm going to act like I'm a Christian every day. But eventually that's going to, it's going to, it's going to wear out eventually. That fake it until you make it, it does not work too well. And so the fact of the matter is you and I, we need to have personal growth in our lives, taking a journey and challenge to be better according to God. It's so fulfilling. It's, it's the best decision a person can make. You know what? I always watch people that are happy, and I wonder, like, man, why are they happy? I'm talking about consistently. And many times people are happy, I notice, because they're growing. When people aren't growing, they're not happy. There are a lot of miserable people, or, you know, because they know they should be somewhere that they're not. Happy people are growing. And so personal growth. First Peter chapter two, verse two through three says, now that you realize how kind the Lord has been to you. Put away all evil. He says, now look, look, so there, there's a journey. Watch this. Watch this. There's a journey. Once you find out how kind God is to you. Meaning, once you get saved and you accept the Lord, look what he says. He says, put away all evil, deception, envy, and fraud. Long to grow up into the fullness of your salvation. So it says, now that you got saved and now you experience God's love and now you, you know, you've been showered with his blood and, and showered with his grace and his mercy. Now what he's saying, you know what you and I need to do? He says, man, put away that stuff. And now guess who he leaves the responsibility on? Now, I know good and well folk don't like to hear that they've got responsibility in this Christian world, but we do. A lot of us don't want to hear that we got responsibility. We don't. Be like, what? I thought I was just sit, supposed to sit on my biscuit and never risk it. Fact of the matter is, God has responsibilities, which equals commitment. And that's why it's a problem, because, you know, responsibility equals commitment. And so it's very important for us to have personal growth. Last but not least, in order for us to continue to be in his presence and in this moment, this moment talking about his presence is we got to have faith in God and his word. That's what we're going to need. We're going to need to have faith in God and his word. Very important for us to have faith in God. And let me tell you something about faith. Faith and obedience go hand in hand. 
You show me a person that's disobedient, and I'm going to show you a person that don't have faith. When you got faith, you obey. Matter of fact, let me put it simple. Faith and obedience, they're first cousins. Why? Because the simple fact, you can't have one without the other. Let me give you a picture. Abraham, they call him the father of faith, right? And so because he's the father of faith, he, he said, go to a place that I'll show you. And what happened was, was Abraham stepped out there. His faith was revealed through his obedience, through him doing what God told him to do. Why do they call him the father of faith? Because he obeyed. You can't put, it takes a lot of faith to sometimes just, it's some ink on a piece of paper and, and you can't process it. It don't make sense with you. That's why we got to learn how to live in these moments. You need to learn how to bring that mountaintop experience down here to earth. We got to learn how to bring that, that, that moment into reality. Why? Because it does not make sense to do this. Like it, that ink on that paper, on, on, it, all of them don't make sense. Now, some of them you'll grab the Bible, you're like, oh, I love that one. You'll highlight it. You love that one. It's great. You're blessed and highly favored. Yes, I am. I was thinking the same thing, God. Right? And so, so we're excited about that one. But now he tells us to sacrifice something. Put away this. Well, I, I actually like that. I want to do that often or sometimes or a few times. But can you make exceptions for me, God, please? And now, or we'll say, you know what? I'll just step out of the moment and then I'll come back because I know you're loving. But remember, I don't care what nobody say. It's always scar tissue. It's always scar tissue. It's always some type of spiritual scar tissue when we, when we you know, just continue to go in and out. Now, one thing that's amazing is God is so loving. Because I'm not talking about legalism here. Please get that. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about perfection. But I am talking about loving God in such a way that you don't want to be disconnected from him no matter what. You don't want to be disconnected with him no matter what. And because of your faith in God and his word, you say, okay, I want to be in your presence. Philippians 4, 9 puts it pretty simple. He says, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. I like that. That's beautiful. That's real good discipleship right there. Because Paul is writing the Philippian church and he said, okay, the things you've learned, like, you know, everything that I taught, and you received and you heard and you seen in me, that's good. That's good. That's good because it, it's not like that no more. Some people want to teach you, but they don't want to do it. They'd rather tell you to do something, but their lifestyle is disconnected from what they're telling you to do. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's, that's somehow then creeped up into the church. Just do as I say, but don't look at me. Don't look at me, but not look at me. You just do what you told, you hear? Legalism. But Paul says the things you learned and received and heard, and you actually even looked at me, and I actually, actually displayed it. You took a picture, bam, and you seen me live this out. I posed this Christian life for you. You know what I'm saying? I revealed this Christian life to you. I walked this thing out. You know what I'm saying? I might have been stumbling sometime. But guess what? I was walking this thing out. I didn't quit. I kept on rolling. Why? You understood. You know what I'm saying? You know, you can apply this now. What? He didn't leave it right there. He said, you know the things you've seen, things you heard, things that I talked to you about, things I taught you? He says, you know what? Practice these things. Now, I like teachers like that. You can teach me. Oh, because I'm sure watching you. I'm watching you. You don't know I'm watching, but I promise you I'm watching. And I'm not watching for fault, but I'm watching for exampleship. Show me, because I'm going to follow your example. And now if you got just one of them and you just want to tell me all the time, okay, that's cool, all right, you want to tell me, I'm going to receive it, but I'm really looking for you to do it as well. But I'm not going to be here judging you now, because I need to learn by all means. But Paul had the full package. Paul said, guess what? The things you learn, you receive, you know, you heard and you seen in me. Paul had the full package. He says, practice these things. And look at the key. He said, when you practice these things, get this, because this is the crux of the entire talk. He says, practice these things. 
and the God of peace will be with you. You will remain in this moment. He said, you do these things, you will actually be in God's presence. For any parent, this is good. Because for any parent, you know, it's not about just telling your kids, don't do something. They need to see you do. Wake up early. You need to be waking up early. Now, of course, you can always, you know, just default, I'm your mama, just hush. I'm your daddy, just be quiet. You can always default to that, and respectfully, they need to do it. But you're not being a leader. You're just an authority. It's a big difference between being an authority and being a leader. Authority is a position. Leadership are taking you somewhere. A lot of Christians, they look at other Christians and they say, Boy, I wish I could live like that. I wish I was as spiritual as they are. Man, they're growing and it seems that I'm not. Have you ever thought that way? That it seemed like they always are connected and they're growing. But you have the same identity they have. Once you accept Christ, you have the same identity they have. Hey, okay, I know you're different personality-wise. Let me explain it like this. At my house, I have a microwave, I have a toaster, and I got an espresso machine. Now, they all got different functions, but I still got to connect them all to the same power. And then they can do their function. One makes espresso, one heats up, you know, food, and another actually makes toast. But they, and they all got different functions. Like everybody on earth has different functions here, but we got the same power we can all be connected to. But we got to learn how to live in these moments. Don't just have the excitement of a moment. What I want you to do is learn how to bring your moment down to your reality. And if you're there, if you're online, if you're here, I want you to close your eyes. I want to pray with you and bow your head. I want to pray that you and I would learn how to bring our moments into our reality. Father, I pray that your joy will be complete through us living in your presence. Help us to become more mature so we won't destroy moments in our lives. Help us to grow into becoming the person that you desired us to be. Help us to be hungry for your presence. Don't let us be people that just refuse to be in your presence. Don't let us be people that don't challenge ourselves to know what you require out of us, oh God. And don't let us, Lord, you know, find ourselves underdeveloped and not in a place where we can grow and, and change and become the person that you created us to be, Lord God. Help us to learn how to live in this moment, to live in your presence, to walk in your presence, to allow your thinking to impress on our thinking, to, to allow you to flow your life through us and in us and on us. Help us to practice the things that you have taught us, that you've shown us through the person of Jesus Christ, things we've read about in the Bible. Help us today in the name of Jesus. Help us to live in this moment. Take this moment back to all of our relationships, to all the people we come in contact with. Help us to make these moments priority in our lives so Lord as you release your life as you release your anointing your presence as we have a moment with you help us to learn how to practice living in this moment day in and day out in Jesus name amen